Uh, good afternoon, every, everyone, and welcome to Celebrate Learning Week and CTLT's online course design showcase session on large scale online interdisciplinary workshop design. Uh, we're really all of you, we're really happy all of you could make it here today. And if everyone can hear me, uh, feel free to send me a reaction, a thumbs up, or an indication in chat that you can hear me. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Um, my name is John Chang. I'm a learning designer at CTLT. I'm co-facilitating this presentation with my colleague, Caroline Boisin, who is a curriculum manager at UBC Health. I would also like to thank Elisa, uh, Rachel, um, our event coordinators who are supporting us behind the scenes, and Suki from CTLT. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge and thank UBC Health, the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and all the health program partners who help support and coordinate the integrated curriculum. And so first, I just wanted to acknowledge that our work takes place on the, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people that UBC is located on. I am situated on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. And we also want to acknowledge the territories and lands that our, partici our participants are located on since we're gathering online today. Please feel free to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are joining us from in the chat window. We're going to provide a link to native land, which will allow you to find which territory you might be situated on. So just a couple of housekeeping items for this session. If you have a question at any time, please feel free to write it in chat and we'll have time at the end of our session to answer those questions. Uh, the session is currently being recorded, so please feel free to turn off your microphones and camera if you do not wish to be recorded. So first, Caroline will outline a bit of the background behind the integrated curriculum and also what the pre-pandemic face-to-face delivery looked like at that time. I will then describe our strategy into how we shifted online last year when COVID-19 prompted everyone to pivot online. We will then summarize some of our lessons learned, what evaluations have shown, and then we'll go into a bit of a large group Jamboard session where we will ask you uh, for some of our, for some, some good ideas and how we move this forward. Uh, we'll also look into considerations for the upcoming delivery in 21-22, and we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. So, Caroline. Thank you, John, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, so, I'll start by introducing the Integrated Curriculum, which is uh, an interprofessional education program that we deliver at UBC Health. Uh, so, for, so, for those of you who are not familiar with what interprofessional education might be, uh, it's when students from two or more professions uh, learn about from uh, and with each other to enable effective collaboration and improve health outcomes. Uh, so really the purpose of the integrated curriculum is to support the development of interprofessional competencies. And we do that by delivering a series of online modules and face-to-face uh, -face workshops on a number of topics, uh, such as ethics, Indigenous cultural safety, health informatics, or professionalism. So in 2020, we had six topics. Uh, we will have five topics in 2021. Um, those online modules and face-to-face -face workshops are delivered to pre-licensure health professional students, mostly in their uh, first two years of their program. Uh, so pre-licensure uh, health professional students can actually be undergraduate uh, for programs like dentistry, medicine, um, dietetics, or graduate programs in occupational therapy or physical therapy, for example. The, the workshops we deliver are usually in the fall and we deliver them during regular hours of learning. And we run each activity, let's say professionalism being an activity, we run them on two separate dates uh, in the fall. 
Uh, to give you an idea, in 2020, 2021, so last year, we had 15 health professional programs participate. Uh, and so that means that more than 2,000 students participated in one of our activities. Uh, and it's important to note that those activities are a required component of student programs. So it's not optional. It's really uh, part of the curriculum. Next, please, John. So this is really to show a little bit of what the pre-pandemic, as we're calling it, design was. So that was in 2019. Uh, so as I explained, uh, if you look at the left of this uh, graph, we have a face-to-face -face activity, let's call it number one, that would last two hours. Students do nor normally a bit of a preparatory work online before attending the face-to-face -face activity. And so for each activity, we have two dates. Date number one, for example, would be October 1st and 500 students would participate on that day. And then on the second day, November 1st, uh, another 500 participants um, would be on that day. And then for each of the dates, we would divide the students into rooms of about 40 students, uh, which means that we would have 12, 12 different rooms on campus with 40 students in each, and each group would be facilitated by one or two facilitators. And we would do that for each date. And so basically what we would do would be to multiply what you're seeing here by eight because we had eight activities. So in 2019, for example, we had more than 220 discrete workshops. So 220 rooms that we had to book on campus for an activity. So that's just to give you an idea of the, uh, the scale of the program. Next, John, please. Uh, in terms of the workshop structure, um, all of them are quite similar in the sense that there is usually some preparatory online module um, for the activities that would be around half an hour to an hour. And then for the face-to-face -face workshop, um, there is some introduction. The facilitators usually deliver some didactic content. Uh, and then the students are divided into smaller groups of around six to seven students to have small group discussions. And then they come back in their groups of 40 students to have uh, large group debriefs. And so most of the activities would be designed that way. Uh, in terms of the learning management systems that we used, um, so all the online modules were housed on Moodle. And then we would use uh, an event management system that we call the Passport uh, to help students register for their um, small groups and also to track and monitor their participation to, um, to the different activities. So now I'll just pass it over to John to explain how we made the shift online last year for this program. All right. Um, thanks, Caroline. Uh, so this shift to online required really extensive planning and this started as soon as we had an idea of the, the decision of what the fall semester would look like, which was that there was obviously not going to be a return to face-to-face -face activities. And so we had a number of considerations that would inform our planning. So from the student's perspective, we wanted to ensure that any redesign would align with interdisciplinary interprofessional learning outcomes and that there would be relevant opportunities for what we call IPC or interprofessional collaboration. Uh, we also want to ensure that, you know, equity and inclusion in terms of the student experience and recognizing that there would be more self-directed asynchronous learning that taking place, that engagement would be different than these face-to-face, -face, than the original face-to-face -face sessions. And we also wanted to acknowledge the workload and stress, you know, especially around Zoom fatigue of this shift to online on top of everything that was happening for students. From the facilitator's perspective, of course, we wanted to make this a very meaningful experience for them as well. And our concerns over video conferencing training in general as Zoom, as most of you know, was quite new for many people. We didn't want our facilitators to become Zoom experts we really wanted them to be focused on facilitating the, the content and the, the learning activities. And there were considerations around over how their roles would be coordinated in all this. And then from a UBC Health perspective, there were considerations over how the content was to be delivered. Um, the coordination and administrative challenges of delivering this at such a scale um, such as how we create optimal interdisciplinary mixes, 
how student attendance was to be tra tracked for, for academic rigor, how programs were consulted and brought, bought into the virtual delivery approach, and how all these were considered, well, how all these were considered within the constraints of the, the limited human resources that we had. And then from a UBC perspective, uh, there were considerations about the technology, resources and support that were available campus-wide, and also the capabilities uh, and restrictions of video conferencing tools. So all of this was, were considerations that we, we, we noted while we were planning. So given these considerations, we also had to look at the challenges and opportunities of shifting online. So creating interdisciplinary mix was a particular challenge given the complexity of the different number of students from the 15 different health programs that were involved in the integrated curriculum. The challenge of creating pre-assigned breakouts versus random given that UBC did not or does not require Zoom accounts for student, students. Um, also the challenge of addressing technology disruptions. How are we going to provide a student, a consistent student experience, um, particularly with varying bandwidth? And how did we deal with bandwidth? How do we deal with bandwidth issues? Um, there's uh, the challenge of administrative coordination, especially around limited human resources. And how, how do we use Moodle um, uh, especially given that, you know, it's a barrier to having a singular consistent experience, which is, you know, given that UBC Health is using Moodle, which is a different learning management system than Canvas, that, which is what most students are used to. But there are also opportunities to shifting online. So shifting a lot of that didactic content online. There's a flexibility of using technology asynchronously um, and for synchronous activities. The fact that we there were no physical classrooms meant less facilitators. There were less face-to-face -face sessions, which meant less physical resources. And also taking advantage of centralized UBC resources like LT Hub, AV Support, CTLT. And we were also running on the principle that maybe the best approach is probably the most simple one. So with these opportunities and challenges in mind, there were sort of three different approaches that were considered. And so the first one was replicating the entire face-to-face -face workshop online using completely synchronous sessions. And while there are benefits of completely synchronizing these wor workshops on virtually through, through Zoom, um, maybe the benefits were like perhaps a more immersive face-to-face -face interprofessional collaboration experience or IPE. Um, and the minimal challenges required to shift the workshop content and structure. There were, there were some very real disadvantages, such as um, a large risk of technology issues with the scale of the del delivery we were planning, and also technology training for facilitators. The second uh, approach we were looking at was shifting much of the didactic workshop contact asynchronously and having larger synchronous workshops with small breakout interdisciplinary groups. And so with a blended asynchronous synchronous delivery, there were advantages such as, you know, there are still relevant opportunities for synchronous interprofessional collaboration, or maybe some lower risks with respect to major technology disruptions. And there was um, a low demand for our facilitators with respect to technology training on there. Um, one of the disadvantages of this obviously is, and maybe with all of these approaches was, there was a required significant, you know, amount of work that was required on the, on the back end, on our end to move this content online and redesign activities. And then the third approach, um, and the last strategy that I would consider was having a completely asynchronous delivery. Um, and so while, Asynchronous provides low risks in terms of technology disruptions, uh, maybe low demands on our facilitators with respect to technology training and less administrative coordination. There were significant challenges in moving content online, designing meaningful and relevant interprofessional activities that may not have aligned with interprofessional outcomes. And also, 
there was a, a challenge, a real disadvantage that interprofessional collaboration might be less valuable for students if done asynchronously. And so the decision was made to redesign these large interdisciplinary workshops with both asynchronous and synchronous activities. So asynchronously students would use Moodle, we retain Moodle for self-regulated learning, but they would also use it before a synchronous session for pre-reading, previewing video vignettes and submitting post-workshop assignments. Synchronously, students would participate in large-scale facilitated Zoom workshops with breakout rooms of interdisciplinary groups. We um, actually performed a, a risk-benefit analysis of randomly assigned breakout rooms versus pre-assigned breakout rooms for uh, these IC uh, integrated curriculum sessions. And given the complexities and risks of pre-assigning interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary breakouts, we recommended randomly assigning students to breakout rooms and for sessions where the dis disciplinary mix was particularly uneven students from disciplines with small numbers were assigned to breakouts breakout rooms manually to ensure that they were spread out amongst the rooms evenly uh, there was a workshop wiki which we used uh, which would be shared with students and this provided um, an accessible, low bandwidth, login free way for students to access workshop information, content and activities, which included an embedded Padlet and video vignettes. And I can share that with you here. So this was just a sample of the wiki that we created and a breakdown of the, the schedule of the workshops um, activities and the video vignettes that were shared during that workshop. And also, um, I can also share the Moodle site that was used uh, for the pre-reading um, and post-workshop assignment templates. And so this was all sort of part of the um, whole workshop uh, experience. And so the goal of this design was to provide a consistent, inclusive experience for students with the least amount of technical barriers as possible for students, facilitators, and UBC Health moderators. Um, we decreased the number of synchronous sessions on Zoom. We shifted two activities to completely asynchronous. Uh, there was a redesign uh, of activities for the synchronous session with uh, small breakout rooms, the use of these Padlets, uh, we use the chat for questions, so really creating sort of that peer-to-peer -peer engagement. We were trying to, um, uh, we were trying to, we were really seriously hoped for in terms of interprofessional um, learning. And we really tried to take advantage of UBC support resources, so IT, AV support, and all of these decisions were done in collaboration and endorsed by the health professional programs. And so the result of the 2020-2021 delivery is summarized in this graphic. Uh, there were six topic areas covered by 11 online modules. There were 77 Zoom sessions attended by about 2,000 students representing the 15 health programs. We had 98 facilitators and about 22 moderators who were supporting the, the workshops in the background. And this is a breakdown of sort of the, the students by program. And Caroline. Thank you, John. Um, so in terms of sort of lessons learned um, from what we did last year, um, so from the UBC Health perspective, of course, um, having a partnership with CTLT was absolutely key to the success of this delivery. And we were very lucky, of course, that we partnered with John, um, who was working for UBC Health uh, previously. Uh, so he had a really good understanding of the integrated curriculum and, and of the online module. So I think that really facilitated uh, the work. Um, it was also very important, as John mentioned, that we had this agreement with participating programs on 
some key principles to guide this transition. Um, and that would really help us uh, make all the decisions uh, throughout the process. We spent a lot of time um, really understanding the technology cap capabilities and limitations. Um, and I know that, you know, faced with this situation last year, it was really tempting to just make decisions quickly and say, okay, we're going to use this and do this and that. But we really took the time to compare different tools, looking at Zoom versus uh, Collaborate, what were our needs, um, what would work better. Um, and that really, really helped and sort of paid off um, afterwards because we, we, I think we made the right decisions with the tools. Creating this moderator role was also very important. So we didn't want to have to train all the facilitators um, on the technology roles because as you will have seen, we had um, 98 facilitators with different levels of comfort with technology. So we created that moderator role um, for staff basically um, at UBC Health and from the Center of Excellence in Indigenous Health. And so moderators were re responsible for uh, creating breakout rooms, uh, launching polls, everything you have to do on Zoom. And that was um, a really important thing as well in, in the success of the delivery that enabled facilitators to only focus on facilitating the content. We had to pay attention to training the facilitators on changes to their role. So um, not that they had to worry a lot about the technology, but that they had to be reminded that they would be facilitating large group of students with you know, up to 150 students. And so they had to understand that this would have, they would have limited interaction with the students. So it was really important for us to make sure they were aware um, of those important changes. We paid a lot of attention to communication, um, communication with programs, with students, with facilitators. Um, we tried to make sure that all the information we shared on processes and all the changes was as clear and, and transparent as possible. Uh, and I think that was also important for um, the success of this delivery. And compassion and patience. Uh, I think this was really key, not only for us, but I think for everybody who was doing that work a year ago, uh, really having compassion for all the programs, all the students who were going through this and compassion to ourselves really for trying to navigate this and to do the best we could with what we have, uh, what we had. And so that was really important and a lot of patience, just making sure that we were explaining things, you know, over and over again, sometimes to a number of programs, just to make sure everyone had the information that they needed. I'd like to continue, John. You're on mute, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I think that compassion really lent itself to also being us being really flexible in the approach and really trying to think of the most inclusive way we could um, create this or develop this experience for our students. Um, we also wanted to really capitalize and leverage on the resources that were available at UBC. So taking advantage of the enterprise software so zoom and and ctlt's help and and avery supports help and ubc it support support and we also wanted to you know thinking as much as you know as um sorry being um as asynchronous as possible with the content and and maximizing the interprofessional synchronous learning experience as possible Um, so we'll just present some of the evaluations. So we did evaluate, I mean, we evaluate the integrated curriculum every year, but we did uh, an evaluation last year with, uh, I guess, an eye on the online delivery. Um, so, I mean, it was great to see that students' ratings of the overall value uh, of the integrated curriculum actually increased in 2020 compared to 2019 when it was done face-to-face. Uh, and also the value of individual activities uh, increased, as you can see in this graph. I think it's interesting to see uh, on this graph that the two activities that we shifted completely asynchronously, resilience and health informatics, so those two activities didn't have a synchronous component, didn't have an interprofessional component. I think this is where the increase was, was the the higher. Uh, so that was interesting data for us um, for us to see. 
Next, please, John. Um, the students' ratings of the overall delivery were actually very similar in 2019 and 2020. Um, so I won't maybe read through all of this, but you can see that the numbers were, um, were pretty good in terms of technology used, the amount of work, uh, of work uh, the role of the facilitators and the small group discussions. The facilitators also felt that the delivery format worked well for them in 2020. Um, they felt that the students were attentive and responsive during the Zoom sessions. They agreed that the technology used was appropriate 100%. Um, and most of them agreed that the design of the sessions uh, was appropriate to meet the learning objectives. Next, please, John. Oh, just one, one before. Yeah, this one, thanks. <laughs> Um, so we found through the evaluation that the online delivery um, had important benefits to program students and facilitators. Uh, so for programs, as John mentioned, um, they had fewer facilitators to recruit because the Zoom sessions had more students. Uh, so that was definitely appreciated by the programs. Uh, they could also increase their facilitator pool because they could recruit um, facilitators outside of Vancouver, uh, pretty much anywhere across the province. And they had sort of less communication to do about logistics because that's something we, we really made sure to pay a lot of attention to through UBC Health. And there was less logistics of having to communicate information to facilitators on where to go and, and what to do. Uh, for students, we were really, really pleased to read that they found many discussions were still very rich, um, which was something we were a little bit worried about going on Zoom with the large group. But I think having a lot of time for students uh, in smaller breakout rooms really um, helped with that. Uh, less time wasted wayfinding um, because prior to 2020, they, we had rooms book all over campus uh, and it was really hard sometimes for the students to even know where they were going. Um, and also it was the ability this year for students at distributed sites to participate. So uh, some of you might not be aware of this, but the undergraduate medical program, for example, at UBC, uh, they have students at four different sites uh, across the province. And so it was difficult prior to 2020 to have them um, participate, of course, in our sessions and have a, a true interprofessional experience. So having everything online made that possible. Um, and for facilitators, um, same comments that less time wasted traveling and way finding on campus was really great. Uh, less troubleshooting with technology in rooms, which was always an issue every year where facilitators didn't know what to expect in the rooms that uh, they were going to use for to facilitate. And so overall, uh, less stress for the facilitators. Next, please. And so we've sort of identified a number of enablers um, that um, help to for effective program delivery. Uh, so as we've said, shifting didactic content to self-directed online modules was, uh, was really key. Uh, we had a co-facilitation model. So in each synchronous Zoom session, we had uh, three facilitators, uh, which was really helpful because it was the first time for all of them, of course, doing this online. So they could really help each other, um, especially when some of them had sort of levels of com varying level of, of comfort with um, technology. Um, having the technology moderator role, um, as we've said, was really important. Um, and we were able to do sort of a more effective framing of the interpretive curriculum um, because we spent, I think, less time on logistics than previous years. Uh, and so we were really able to communicate a bit more and a bit better to programs about, you know, the purpose of the integrated curriculum um, and make sure that it was really well understood by programs and students. And also we were able to do the uh, facilitator training online. Uh, and this was something we would normally do face-to-face -face prior to 2020. And attendance was really high to those training um, because we did it online. Uh, some areas of improvement that we identified through the evaluation uh, was to create more time for breakout discussions. So even though we really sort of redesigned the uh, synchronous Zoom sessions to have most of the time spent in small breakout rooms, students still felt that they could use more time. Uh, so that's something we'll be taking into consideration. Um, increase consistent attention to interprofessional mix in the breakout rooms. Um, so as John mentioned, we used random breakout rooms um, to create those small groups. And so we rearranged then manually those breakout rooms to 
make sure they had a good balance of students from different programs, but uh, it was still not perfect. So, uh, so we'll continue to work on that. And then to create mechanisms to increase accountability for individual participation. Uh, that's mostly true for uh, the activities that students do in their small breakout rooms that are self-facilitated. And so we've heard from a number of students that some students could just be, you know, on mute and not have their video on and not really participate and only have their names for the group assignment. So we're trying to think about ways to increase that accountability. And maybe some of you, when we have the discussion piece, can, can share some ideas they might have for us to do that. And so, yeah, what we're going to do next is ask you to think for a few for a few minutes about these questions. And it's not going to be a breakout room activity, but it's it's uh, going to be a large group Jamboard. And so I want you to take about five to seven minutes to think about these questions. What would you do differently um, considering the design considerations, challenges and opportunities? What would you do to re redesign or rethink how we delivered the integrated curriculum? And so um, we're going to insert this Jamboard link or Caroline has already just shared it, um, which will be um, used to post your sort of sticky note ideas about how we should really rethink this. And after about five to seven minutes, we'll come back and discuss in a larger group debrief. And if you, if somebody has already posted their, uh, a really great idea and you, you like that idea, I would simply just use this pen tool and do a check mark like that. So we'll give about maybe five minutes, five to seven minutes, and we'll call everyone back. I think maybe most people have had a time to contribute their thoughts. What do you think, Carolyn? Yeah. So maybe we can go through some of these. Um, obvious linking, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, how to continue the discussions after the workshop? I think that's actually a good opportunity to use maybe asynchronous an asynchronous platform, the asynchronous discussions on Canvas. Maybe Carolyn can speak to that with respect to continuing. Yeah, it's really noisy at the moment at my place. So I hope the sound is okay. Can you hear me fine? Yes, you're perfect. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> Apologies for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've definitely thought about continuing um, the conversations after the workshops. I think one of the limitations for that is that we we were given, I guess, by each program, um, what we call protected time to do those activities. So we don't have unlimited time that we can ask students to be working on those activities. So that would be uh, some sort of consideration that you know any work that we do after a workshop would have to be somehow consider it part of the activity. So maybe we would have to reduce then the, the duration of the workshop itself of the pre-work. So it's just one limitation, I guess. But as you were saying, John, that's something that we were not able to do maybe using Moodle in the past and that we might be able to do as we are transitioning everything to Canvas this year. So having more, um, yeah, functionalities to do that on Canvas. Definitely a possibility for sure. Um, is there any advantage to using the Zoom breakout fe feature that now allows you to choose what room you go to? Would this make it more diverse or more work? That's a great question. I think it's to, to sort of, I think Caroline can speak to this, but I think to maintain that interdisciplinary mix, we wanted to ensure that students were placed into real interdisciplinary groups and not simply choosing groups that their friends or people that they might know might be in. And so we really wanted to create sort of that interprofessional experience. Um, but didn't you indicate yeah. that you, ought, you randomly, you let it randomly assign them? 
or did you met with someone behind the scenes manually putting them into groups? No, so they're randomly assigned. So we just tell Zoom, please create whatever, yeah. six groups. And so they're randomly assigned, but because we ask students to rename themselves, as you were saying, Donna, on the Jamboard, at the beginning of the workshop and indicate what program they're from, then the moderators could just go, once the breakout rooms have been created, they can just go there and see, <clears throat> excuse me, if they see too many students from the same program in a room, they can just rearrange the rooms manually. So that's what we've done as moderators to try to make the, the, the breakout rooms more balanced. But I think, I mean, we didn't have that feature a year ago, right? To have people choose their own breakout room. Mm -hmm. That's something we could do and that students, you, we could tell them, okay, just have a look through all the breakout rooms. And if you don't see anyone from your profession or you don't see a lot of people from your profession, please join that breakout room. Mm -hmm. That could work. Um, but I think the limitation is the one that John just said that they might tend to go with their friends. Um, and we, we rather, I guess, create different groups each time. So, yeah. yeah. I was thinking if the groups are like, group one group two and then you said to all you, you gave all the, the students a number and that they go to that group so it's but still a lot of work behind the scenes for the moderators to do that i think yeah yeah, yeah for sure because we're looking at groups of 100 students so it's it's a lot to do and we don't always have the time as moderators to do that before the first breakout room has to start Um, what else? So I like this comment of someone saying, wonder if there's a way to have the breakout rooms facilitated and do students like it when teachers randomly pop into breakout rooms? That's so <laughs> <laughs> we've heard that they don't like it. Um, I mean, not so much that they don't like it, but it's sort of, um, sometimes it, it really stops the dynamics, uh, in which they were, and they were having a good conversation and someone comes in and they have to explain, I guess, you know, what they were talking about. Um, so we've heard that it wasn't really great. And the limitation for us is really that when we have a group of 100, 100 students, that means 15 breakout rooms. And if you have an activity that's for 20 minutes, basically the facilitators don't even have time to go in each breakout room. Um, so that's not something that we've tended to do. Um, so we try to, for each activity, we ask students to actually define uh, or assign uh, a facilitator within the small group and assign a scribe so they really have to self-facilitate. Is there a way to track which disciplines are interacting in, e in the breakout room? The student participation pie chart you shared earlier seemed like there was a healthy mix of disciplines. And so each session is designed to, I guess, hold, each session is, has been predetermined for, a, I guess, a, I believe a few disciplinary mixes. And so there is a way to know which disciplines we already know which disciplines are participating in each workshop to determine who is participating in each breakout room is a, would be a little bit more difficult if it was randomly assigned. And so we're trying to think of ways in how this could be achieved. And so for the fall delivery, for this upcoming fall delivery, we're actually considering, because we are moving this to Canvas, um, using Canvas groups, and potentially creating interdisciplinary mixes before that on Excel spreadsheets um, and uploading those inter interdisciplinary groups into Canvas that way. For interdisciplinary mixes in a workshop, um, I think that's still something we're, we're still trying to also figure out. Um, yeah, I mean, We'll probably do the same, right? For the all the reasons that we've talked about, um, it will be easier in a way for moderators because we're we'll be having in 2021 um, slightly fewer students in the large Zoom session. So last year we had up to 150 students. Uh, we're trying to decrease that number to no more than 100 students in each um, Zoom session. So it will be easier for the moderators to rearrange that gr those groups. Um, but just to that point, Join, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have two dates for each of our activities. And on each of those dates, um, we have a group of programs that participate. So uh, we always know what program participate on what date. 
Um, so it's not that all the programs can be on either of those dates. Uh, on day one, we will have, let's say, OT, PT, and nursing students, and day two will be only pharmacy, dentistry, and medical students. So we know that uh, initial disciplinary mix. Um, and so then in the breakout rooms, it's those programs that get mixed together for that particular day. There was also um, a comment saying building better directions for the task in the breakout rooms, perhaps to increase the amount of, in of individual involvement. Um, so that's around accountability. And there was another one, create some individual assignments that students must prepare and submit before synchronous breakout room sessions. Um, and another one in, in this, I guess, theme, require the group to submit a summary after a synchronous breakout room sessions. I think those are all really great ideas. We're definitely considering improving the, um, the direction for the task that we give to students in the breakout rooms, because that's uh, we, we got comments from the students that they needed to have very uh, clear tasks. So that's something we'll be paying some attention to for this year. Um, and we do require the group to submit uh, a group assignment at the end of each synchronous breakout room session. And that's how we track attendance. Uh, but I quite like this idea of creating some individual assignment that students must prepare and submit before. Um, Although I guess for us, we've been using the assignment as a way to track attendance. So that would be, we would still require to have something that they also submit after the workshop. So that would just be more work for the students. So lots of <laughs> limitations and things, but thanks for sharing those ideas with us. That's, that's wonderful. You. I think we have one more slide before we get to a, a Q and A. Yeah, so really based on what we've presented and, um, and the uh, evaluation that we did, um, we made some decisions already, of course, for the delivery in the fall of 2021, and we're working on the planning right now. So we've made the decision to deliver the integrated curriculum fully online again. Um, although UBC has said that some classes will be face-to-face, -face, we felt that because of the nature of interprofessional learning and the fact that we are mixing students from so many different programs um, that we would just deliver it online again. Um, we are transitioning to Canvas, as we mentioned, which is uh, a big project in itself uh, that we've been thinking about for a number of years and we are finally <laughs> doing. So this will have implications are our communication processes, uh, information we share with the students, programs and facilitators. Um, we will not be using the wikis anymore because we will just have the ability to have this information on Canvas and have it visible to the students only on the day of the workshop. Um, so really uh, we're seeing some great advantages of, of being on Canvas for these kind of, um, of features. We are faced with some unique challenges with interprofessional group creation on Canvas uh, because Canvas is not, I guess, designed for um, interdisciplinary learning. So it doesn't, when you have a group of students from different programs, enrolled in a given course, it doesn't actually show you what program they're from. So that's a bit of a problem when you want to create interprofessional groups, but we are, uh, we've been working with the LT Hub uh, and uh, the data governance unit to find some solutions. So, and that's something that maybe John at some point will want to present uh, <laughs> in another presentation because it's been interesting. Um, we're making, as I said, also the decision to have students do an individual assignment uh, or at least submit an individual assignment at the end of each workshop instead of a group assignment uh, to increase accountability. And we're adjusting the length of some of the Zoom sessions. So last year, we tried to make them as short as we could. Some of them were just one hour. Uh, and we heard from students that that was actually a little bit too short. So we're moving back to one hour and a half for um, a number of them. We're having fewer students in the large Zoom session, as I said, so closer to 80 to 100 students versus the 150 that we had last year. And we're continuing with the co-facilitator model, the technology moderator role, and the online facilitator training, uh, as we, we heard those really worked. And I guess beyond 2021, um, we'll have to have, of course, conversation with our program partners to see what the delivery will look like. Uh, but what we're hearing is that uh, we might go back face-to-face -face 
for some of the activities, especially the ones that have more sensitive content, uh, like Indigenous cultural safety, some of the ethics curriculum, but that they would like to continue the online delivery for other activities. So we anticipate that we will just have a, a blended approach and that we will probably never go back to having to book 220 rooms across campus, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> uh, so I think this has really changed um, the way we're delivering this, this program. And then with that, we have about five more minutes of Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into chat or turn on your mic. Donna. Um, just so fantastic, you two. Well done, well done, well done. Um, really shines a light on, on UBC and how innovative and committed we are to this. Do you have um, thoughts about what other large university, large scale universities are doing similar to this? Or are we kind of the most innovative and leading the way on this? Or are there any lessons we can learn from say U of T or McGill or Dalhousie, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Donna. And it's interesting because, of course, when we were doing this work a year ago, I was trying to search the internet to see what other people are doing. Please help. And, of course, we didn't know at that time. <laughs> so since then, um, I've heard of a couple of uh, examples. And it's interesting to see that most universities have done something quite similar. Uh, so some of them have actually moved everything asynchronously. So just made the decision not to have an interprofessional component or just move it online through discussion boards. Um, but then other universities have done something quite similar to what we've done, um, moving um, you know, the sessions on Zoom, um, having slightly like bigger groups. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I've seen. I don't have lots of examples. I've seen only a, a couple of institutions, but I think that's something that would be really interesting to monitor and, and compare um, yeah, across Canada or even in the U.S. with the IP programs. Yeah, and I haven't actually looked into the the literature or the recent literature to see what's what's being done, especially with interprofessional education. Um, but it would be interesting to see what what some of the larger universities are doing. Any other questions? I guess uh, I'll ask again, I kind of know the answers to these, but I, it's always good to ask some more. Um, are we going back to, or do we um, do any pre and post student uh, um, survey around um, change, like change in, in them around competency acquisition? So from the, I know from the beginning of participating in the IC to the end, and I know yeah. that's hard to isolate just this integrated curriculum because many programs are doing other forms of interprofessional engaged learning. So I know it's hard to isolate it, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess just to, for other people to have the context, we did an evaluation, so prior to, Pre-pandemic in 2019, we did um, evaluate the uh, interprofessional competencies sort of pre-post. So we asked students their perception of the interprofessional competencies before doing the integrated curriculum and after they had done the integrated curriculum. Um, although we did that as a retrospective pre-post, so they answered the question at the same time. We didn't get like the results we got. It was a slight in Increase is like it improved slightly. It wasn't really significant from the data that we got. Um, and I think, as you're saying, Donna, what we're seeing is that, of course, because the integrated curriculum is delivered throughout two years of their programs, they are exposed to a number of other interprofessional uh, experiences outside of the integrated curriculum, um, mostly in their clinical placements. So it's really hard, as you know, to isolate really where they are getting those competencies from. So really the direction that we're moving towards is to work with programs to encourage them and help them measure um, those interprofessional competencies throughout their programs, like throughout the four year, two years, whatever it was, including the, the activities of the IC. 
but I think from what we've done, it wasn't really reliable data, uh, what we got from that 2019 evaluation on interprofessional competencies. But again, this is ongoing conversations and it's, especially with the programs, it's not something that us as UBC Health, we decide by ourselves and it's, it's an ongoing conversation with 15 partner programs. Any other questions before we wrap up our showcase today? Thanks, Donna. <laughs> That's all. If, if you have more questions, feel free to email Caroline or I. Caroline will be only with us for another couple more weeks. She's, unfortunately, she's leaving us forever. <laughs> um, she's going back to France. Um, but if you do have questions, I'm, I'm sure both of us can, can help um, answer any of your questions. Um, I would like to plug a couple of Celebrate Learning events. So there's, of course, your Celebrate Learning Week uh, events calendar, which you can find here. Um, well, I will put that in the chat. And also my colleague Manuel is co-facilitating this workshop on blended learning with another colleague from CTLT, Lucas Wright and Dr. Charlene Black from the School of Population and Public Health. And that is um, shaping our future uh, blended learning from a different lens. And that can be found here. And then my other colleague, oh, try to transition to that slide. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Bo Sun Kim is co-facilitating this online course design showcase on single point rubrics with Dr. Alifa Bandali from the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality and Social Justice. If you would like to attend that event, that showcase, which is similar to the format you find here almost, uh, you can find that here. And I'm just going to copy that link. Sorry about that. And finally, there is one last showcase I want to highlight, which is going to take place sometime um, around the end of June, June 29th, I believe. Uh, my colleague um, Nam Suk. Jung is going to be hosting another showcase on team-based learning. And so um, look out for that on CTLT, on the CTLT events page. And uh, we really want to thank everyone who's attended the session. And um, oh yes, and one last thing is uh, please uh, fill out the feedback form that Elisa has highlighted in the chat. Uh, we'll give us some really good feedback on today's session. And uh, I'd like to thank my co-presenter, Caroline, for doing this, presenting this with me. It was a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much, John.